Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Talk for Talks. Uh, this edition, this week, we are looking at we are, we are having a guest uh, who is going to join us shortly. Good morning. Welcome to Acting Talks. You are welcome for this edition this week. My name is Abel Esero. We are going to be joined by our guest called Charity Ahimbisibwe. Uh, she is, will joining us shortly. This edition we are going to be looking at uh, uh, beyond 2021. We are going to be discussing issues concerning Uganda's democracy. Well, Uganda's democracy at Crossroad. You know, we have had, we have just concluded elections of 2021. So we are going to be assessing some of the events what that transpired in the elections of 2021 and we are trying to give it meaning and see whether we are progressively going moving forward democratically or we are still moving returning backwards so we want to understand and make sense out of our democracy in uganda what is happening to uganda as a country we have had had elections ever since 1958 uh, we, we, we have also and now we have about we have, we have held about 11 elections since the first election was held in 1958. Of course, we know that we got independence in 1962, and the first election we 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 we, we, we had after independence was in 1980. But all what happened in all those elections has not been so so good. Uh, very many contestations came in. Very many people were not happy with what transpired that's why the reason even why the current president who is seven during the 1980 elections after what happened in elections he did not accept and appreciate that what transpired was free and fair so he decided to go and fight for his rights and victory which he claimed the person who the UPC that won the elections during that time did not win it in a free and transparent manner. So we are going to be discussing some of the things. So as we are wait, as we are wait for our guests to join us, we do know that Uganda uh, this week there was there were issues concerning attempted assassination of one of our former commander in the army. We have had a lot of issues concerning those assassinations previously. So we are trying to understand and look at what is wrong with our country. Are we moving in a progressive way or we are just lagging behind in terms of our institutions, the strengths of our institutions? So we want to understand from the various perspectives. Of, of course, we do understand there are key elements that we need to always appreciate about democracy. In a democratic state, we have to always hold elections whereby citizens come in and vote for their leaders without being coerced, without being given money, without being oppressed. So they have to have the free will to vote their leaders in a more credible and transparent manner. So if the citizens are not given chance to vote their leaders, in a free, credible manner, they will not believe in the leaders who have gone through because they believe in a process that if you want to have a leader in place, you first have to elect, participate in electing that leader and it should not be coerced. So we believe that active participation of people or citizens in politics is so crucial for them to have the belief that the governance systems in place are supporting them or they are part and parcel of the government. But when government starts mistreating citizens uh, by arresting them, uh, putting them into prisons, you find that most of the things that happen will not be of goodwill to the citizens. So they will start looking at the state or the government in place as a government that is not helping or after protecting the interest of the citizens, but protecting the interests of other individuals. So we are going to look at 
all those aspects of democracy where we need to see is government protecting the human rights of all the citizens are citizens all participating in electing their leaders are they participating through free will or they are being coerced are they being intimidated during the election process do we have institutions in place that are looking after all those people are trying to manipulate and undermine our democracy and also our elections so we are trying to look at all those aspects so that we can be able to ensure that to assess uganda as a country and look forward for reforms that can help uganda grow as a as a democratic nation and advance to a more and credible country with political hygiene that everyone appreciates uh, as we wait for our guest, uh, I would like to first take you through some of the things that transpired. Do we know that during the pre-campaign period, before we went for campaigns, a lot of things transpired. We had, uh, see, we saw through NRM primaries and also other party primaries, a lot of money exchanged hands for people to be voted. We saw how, how, how security officers and men in other, in other plain clothes were harassing some of the opposition political parties and, and candidates. We saw how there was a lot of character assassination on social media through various camps. So all these things went through and even went beyond the pre-campaign and was, they were still evident during the campaign phase, whereby we saw a lot of arrests. Most of the opposition political parties, I mean, political leaders were, were blocked from conduct, conducting their, their consultative meetings and campaigns. Uh, we also saw the selective application of the law in terms of uh, enforcement of the COVID guidelines. So we, we are trying to make sense out of all this. We are asking ourselves, is Uganda's democracy as crossroads? So we need to try and understand all this and demystify if there is anything that is affecting Uganda's democracy. What is it? How do we move on from there? Do we need reforms to be put in place, but if we if, even if they put reforms in place, how effective are the reforms? Are they being implemented? Are they being followed by all the political actors? So you find that sometimes reforms are being made and put in place, but the people who are supposed to enforce or implement them don't do it effectively. And also the players who are supposed to play within or to abide by the laws that have been put in place do not accept to play within the rules so they decide to do their own things and decide that tends to jeopardize our democracy. So we want to call upon all the political parties. We know that there are always disagreements within various parties, whether it's NRM, whether it's a Forum for Democratic Change, whether it's for National Unity Platform. We are always seeing political parties trying to fight for power. Of course, power it doesn't come freely. Everyone has to come and fight for it, but the fighting should be positive fighting it shouldn't be so physical it shouldn't be a do or die thing whereby you 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 fight uh, uh you 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 start spread, spreading hate speech so you need to use ideologies to try and buy or convince people that you are the right political party you are the right candidate use your ideas do not use money do not use force, do not use violence, do not intimidate people. So all the things that are intimidatory, that are coercive, do not help us in any way to grow our democracy. Uh, we have seen in very many countries uh, where democracy has, uh, has continuously been retarding or sliding back. When we see a lot of security involvement in an electoral process, 
and they act in a partisan, a partisan manner. First of all, the electorates themselves lose trust in the electoral process, and they also lose trust in the institutions that are mandating that electoral process, and they lose trust also in the leaders that will be elected through that process. So we do understand that building trust among citizens, among the bodies that are managing elections is so crucial if Uganda is to progress to the next level of advanced democracies. But if we still see things that do happen in a manner of where we see a lot of opponents like in opposition parties are being arrested and put into custody. A lot of civil society organizations are not being able to be accredited to monitor elections uh, on various reasons. Uh, a lot of involvement of uh, uh, non plained security officers arresting people does not help us move forward. So we are today in this kind of state because there are other actors who believe politics or elections is their own game and no one can beat them in their own game. So they make it a do or die. They take us back to those incidents that used to happen during the state of nature where life was so solitary, uh, brutish and harsh where people would fight themselves to the extent that they didn't know whether they are all brothers or sisters, they just fight themselves because of their own selfish motives, because anyone wanted, whoever wanted to rule or to take over something, had to make sure he has first clear all his enemies. So that is not the kind of politics I would urge any other country in Africa or in the other world, or even politicians, to be practicing. I believe that we as Ugandans and also Africans need to appreciate that democracy is all about ideas. It's all about you selling your ideas to the electorates, to the people you want to be with, and you be able to show them your potential. But it's not all about you using your muscle, physical muscle to fight or using money to induce people to vote for you, that does not help in advancing our democracy. That only kills our democracy. So we need to always look for ways in which we grow our democracy by making sure we put in place strong systems, in terms of strong electoral management bodies, all security agencies that engage in electoral activities should behave in a professional manner. They should not be partisan in the manner of serving the interests of certain candidates and ignoring other candidates. So we, we, we look up to a Uganda where everything is inclusive, is transparent, is credible, is fair. There is part full participation of citizens in civic and political processes, uh, institutions like civil society organizations are not looked at as enemies of the state. So with all this kind of things, we believe that Uganda as a country can move and grow beyond just what we are looking at right now. Of course, any country that is trying to develop democratically has to go through very many uphill starts. So there are very many challenges that you go through before you, you can become a fully fledged democratic country. But of course, even, even those other countries that we look at as advanced, they also have some challenges in their own systems. So I don't think there's any perfect democracy in the world currently because even countries like America, they always have their own issues. We saw when Trump wanted to not leave office because he thought they had reached him, so he was not believing in the institutions 
that have presided over. So even in those other countries that look at us perfect democracies, at times there are things whereby, times whereby we, we envy them, but there are also things we learn from them which we should not repeat. We need to appreciate that democracy is all about the people's will. Democracy is not all about few people deciding for others, but it's all about involving very many people. Uganda as a country had its first elections in 1958. Uh, that election was an election that was conducted under the supervision of the colonial masters. But Uganda's election of 1958, 1961, 1962, all these elections as they were being held we also very many gaps in them in terms of violence, in terms of hate speech, all those other things. This continued to grow. So that incidences in 1980 elections where people were being abducted, uh, people were, were being denied to get nominations, people were being arrested. Uh, in some areas, voting voter, voting processes were voting vote, voting was was not done in a transparent manner. So all these things affected the elections in 1980. That's why we saw one of the candidates that participated in that election decided to run and. He, he decided not to accept the results of that victory. That is Yoweri Kabuta Museven, the current president of Uganda. He contested the results. He said, no, this can't be an election because of the things that have transpired in it. But today, him as the president of Uganda, he has participated in 1996 elections, participated in the 2001 elections, 2006 elections, 2011 elections, uh, 2016 elections, and 2021 elections. But we ask ourselves, all these elections, have they been credible, free, and fair? So we find it so very difficult uh, in, a manner, in, in a way that uh, most of these elections have had their own gaps and challenges. And they have been emerging as events transpire. Reforms have been put in place to try to mitigate some of the gaps or the problems that have been affecting the elections, but still, we are still seeing new things emerge. So we are going to be discussing those things so I would like to go for a short commercial break so that we can return. The master of money politics is eating up Uganda's democracy. When you take money from a candidate, it means you are feeding the monster. Then you become a part of the problem. When a candidate who overspends on campaigns is elected, he or she will not represent voters but himself. He or she will engage in corruption to recover campaign money. Social services will not be delivered and the voter will suffer more. Voter. Let's be wise. Give democracy a chance. Do not sell your vote. Focus on the issue.
So welcome back from that short commercial break. We are going to be joined shortly uh, by uh, one of our substitutes who is going to replace the other guest who has a, who has a bit some technical issues. So as I had earlier told you, this is Axum Talks. We are going to be discussing beyond 2021 is Uganda's democracy at crossroads. We have seen very many things transpire in Uganda ever since we attained independence in 1962. Uh, so we are trying to look at how have we progressed as a country. Of course, we are, there are very many key elements of democracy that we have put in place. We have, first of all, appreciated that uh, we are now holding elections in period, periodically. Uh, ever since uh, we, we, the NRM government came into place, we appreciate them for inst instituting uh, periodic elections. We have seen that uh, there have been uh, very many things or steps towards improving Uganda's democracy, not only that elections are being put in place, but we also have uh, things that have been put in place. We have a 1995 constitution that was put in place to help us run our country within a manner that is legally acceptable. We have institutions in place like the parliament, uh, we have the judiciary, the executive, all these are helping us in running the government. So we have all put up these institutions to help advance Uganda as a country democratically and see that we are in a more governable society, not in a society which is not governable and everyone is doing his or her things without following the agreed upon or put in place laws. But regardless of all such steps being put in place, of course there have been some challenges that Uganda has faced, which we shall be discussing shortly as uh, so one of our substitute guests is logging in. So as for now, let's first uh, play some videos in this short commercial break as we await. Uganda's democratization process suffers from highly commercialized politics. Too much money circulates in Uganda's election and it's mind-blogging where it comes from. Uganda's economic experience a deep in gross domestic product, GDP, every time a general election is concluded. One way of curbing this is through campaign finance legislation. And this is what ACFIM has been advocating since 2015. This advocacy intensified in 2019. ACFIM has been able to engage uh, the different caucuses of parliament so that they can appreciate that there is a bigger problem when it comes to uh, money in politics. And also appreciate that the only easy way of addressing that problem is through a legislation. ACFIM has engaged MPs but also mobilizing them to support uh, the campaign finance law. On February 26th and 27th, debate on campaign finance legislation finally reached the floor of parliament following five years of sustained advocacy. We have seen the, 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 the economy really being affected by a lot of money flowing, chasing little and causing inflation. And, uh, and th this is uh, something which we felt that it is extremely important to really regulate, come up with a law to limit 
this big big expenditure of money that really affects and hurts our economy someone would pour two billion in an election imagine for a member of parliament slot the campaign financing we are raising if we really become serious it will be done but there will be colleagues who say we don't need it but until it hits them that's why so for me i would suggest madam speaker that my colleague there be allowed to bring that campaign financing uh, bill to attach something in the electoral process other than waiting because it's an opportunity for it. After two days of heated debate, legislators confirmed with the recommendation of the legal and parliamentary committee that Uganda needs not provisions scattered in different electoral laws, but a standalone law on campaign financing. This is a reinforcement of Akfin's position on the same. This being a new area of the law within our legislative advocacy efforts, many members of parliament felt that regulation of political finance would be a move to kick themselves out of parliament. Because you realize that most of them do come to parliament as a result of excessive expenditures during elections. Uh, when we heard that uh, the committee on legal was coming to Bunyoro, we took it as a golden opportunity uh, to massively mobilize local people. We're interested in making sure that we emphasize the need to legislate on campaign financing, specifically for the committee to appreciate the need to create a cap on how much and how uh, the money that is invested in uh, campaigns is tracked. If campaign finance disclosure provisions had gotten integrated into the national electoral laws, it would have created a higher level of transparency and accountability. If those campaign finance uh, provisions had been uh, embedded in the electoral laws of Uganda, it would have gone a long way in uh, changing the electoral playing field because then we would have for the first time gotten provisions to regulate and level the playing field for uh, elections. It would have helped women and youth who have not had the access to be able to compete with the men who have gained a lot of access in social financing. All is not lost, because at least when you look around, the subject of uh, legislating on uh, electronic campaign financing has gained detraction, not only within uh, parliament, but also within the political parties and the citizenry, but also the media. Since 2015, ACFIM has been advocating for the enactment of campaign finance law that regulates money in politics and electoral processes. ACFIM will not relent until Uganda has legislation to shield electoral processes from the toxic effect from unregulated money. Partner with us. Help support ACFIM's mission of contributing towards building electoral integrity by promoting transparency and accountability in financing of political processes through research, civic engagement, monitoring and advocating for reforms. Contribute today at www.politicalfinanceafrica.org slash donate. Together, we can contribute towards enhancing democracy as a viable system of governance in Uganda. Contact us at akfim at politicalfinanceafrica.org or akfimuganda at gmail.com or www.politicalfinanceafrica.org Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Of 2011 general elections, Kampala was rocked by citizen demonstrations toward named walk to work protests. Citizens were protesting against hyperinflation that characterized the aftermath of the elections. Economists attributed hyperinflation to sudden increase in growth of currency in circulation during campaign period for 2011 general elections. The Bank of Uganda governor testified in an interview with the Financial Times that he had allowed the recirculation of 50,000 currency notes into the, the economy. This uh, increased and bloated 
the volume of currency in circulation and uh, shocked the economy so badly that inflation rose up to 30%. ACFIM was formed to monitor money in, in electoral campaigns, but also to ensure that it engages with, with policymakers to, uh, with a view of uh, making sure that uh, uh, we avoid the recurrence of what happened in 2011. We work with the political parties uh, to try to push uh, for work mechanisms and ways of promoting transparency in campaign financing, but also we work with the gov other government institutions such as the uh, Ministry of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, Electoral Commission, uh, including Parliament, to make sure that we work around regulatory framework that can insulate the country from the vagaries of highly commercialized electoral politics. In 2015, we managed to start supporting ACFIM. I think we were one of the first organizations to support ACFIM to try and think through how they're going to address these issues and these problems. People were increasingly growing tired of commercialized politics. They knew it would be very difficult to try and persuade parliamentarians or councillors or others to take seriously their concerns about health or education or the state of their feeder roads, the state of sanitation, access to clean water, boreholes, all these things. But once you've taken the shilling, a lot of people felt, well, we can't ever push them and advocate for trying to get these things to change. But I think change will happen, and people like ACFIM are the people who are going to make that change come a reality. Every day at Alliance for Finance Monitoring Uganda is another opportunity to shine a light on the dark sides of money in politics, build civic competence for political accountability, and propose feasible remedies for building electoral integrity in Uganda. We achieve this mainly through political finance monitoring and making information publicly available. At the time of Akfimu's inception, it looked a flimsy idea, but at least we managed to look at something that nobody was looking at, how finances are got to be used in the politics of Uganda. The work of Akfim, one of the things they're trying to do is to sensitize the masses against voter bribery. Now, voter bribery goes hand in hand with the components or the tenets of corruption. So we're able to appreciate the reasons as to why probably politicians are bribing people and why people expect to be bribed. ACFIM was able to amplify our work, especially on issues of accountability and on issues of having free and fair elections, in that you're getting leaders that are not bribing their way into their positions. I bought into the idea uh, because it was feeding into what we had in Transparency International. Of course, it was a loose coalition which had no legal basis, which proved uh, complicated. So, as Transparency International Uganda, we decided to take up the mantle of, of having the legal cover for ACFI. So, by the time elections reached, it was quite a formidable coalition. Uh, which brought on board more than 16 NGOs who were like-minded. I'm very happy and confident that ACFIM can only grow stronger and stronger as time goes on. ACFIM's vision, a society where political leaders are responsive and accountable to citizens. ACFIM's focus is on three strategic priority areas. Monitoring political financing, civic engagement for political and electoral accountability, and campaign finance reforms. ACFIM strongly believes that regulating money in politics is crucial for Uganda's democratization process and will make ceaseless efforts sensitize citizens on to become complicity in a game that subverts the democratic process. Elections must not become a venue for running down the national economy. Contribute today at www.politicalfinanceafrica.org slash donate. Together, we can contribute towards enhancing democracy as a viable system of governance in Uganda. Contact us at akfim at politicalfinanceafrica.org or akfimuganda at gmail.com or www.politicalfinanceafrica.org Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. So how do they enable video? Come. Okay. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, good morning, good morning, Charity. A very good morning, Abel. I don't know if you hear me, but I'm failing to turn on my video. It says start calm, but I can't start calm. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Fine. We can roll without my face if the camera can't come on because we are late. Yeah, uh, we are indeed late. Wow. So we are going to be very brief. Uh, today we have our guest. Uh, she is Charity Ahim Simple. She is the executive director of SEDU, that is Citizens Coalition for Electoral Democracy Uganda, a civil society organization that is known for observing elections in Uganda. And we saw them launch their report, their report findings of the 2021 general elections. And most of our discussion is going to retreat around some of the findings and also the general things concerning Uganda's democracy. So, Charity, I know you yes. have been in the arena of electoral democracy for so long, and you have seen very many things transpire in our country, Uganda. I uh, will start by, we, we, we had the pre-campaign and campaign periods, and we're all mad with violence. I want to understand from why is it that elections in Uganda over time are turning to be a do or die affair? Elections in Uganda are actually turning to be a do or die affair because of money involved in elections, but also because of the money involved after you are elected. Because every member of parliament is thinking about the financial benefit that will come from that position that they are going to occupy. And even when you look at local governments, Oh, our network connections, we have lost her. She was still giving us uh, our own views that the reason why elections are do or die affair in Uganda is because uh, money, a lot of money is involved during elections and also after elections, after people being elected. So, uh, of which I can agree with her because nowadays in Uganda, a lot of people invest in money to be elected. And to ensure that they win this election. They have to do whatever it takes, whether it's fighting, killing each other, and doing each and every nasty thing which does not require to be done in any democratic country or in any, ele in any election. You see that the influence of money makes it so obscene to the extent that you find things which are not really democratically upright being done in order for someone to win an office. And you also find that after someone has won an office, he or she will again use dubious means of accessing money or trying to recoup what he or she has spent during an election. And this has affected how the relationship between the leaders and the voters in the constituencies in Uganda. And you find that there's no improvement in the livelihood of Ugandans voters in most of the air parts of the country because politicians after investing a lot of money and winning an election, an electoral seat, they tend to first of all leave their constituencies and they tend to relocate to places like Kampala where they are situated and they just go back when it's time for them maybe to look for votes and also try to build more momentum and more ground for them to be able again to win the next election. So they don't go there necessarily to help the people, but to do things for their own benefit. So issues of a do or die affair in an election in Uganda today is really, is really making, is one of the things that is putting Uganda's democracy at crossroad. We are having leaders and politicians who perceive an election as an event, not as a process, and not as a process that is transparent, fair, and credible. So we have to look for ways in which we try to address some of these loopholes that we see and some of these perceptions where people want to invest in a lot of money to be elected as leaders. We need to front uh, ideas over money 
in whatever thing we do. So for now, we are going to go for a short commercial break as we work on the technical technical challenges our, our, our guest is facing so that we can be able to return. COVID-19 lockdown has left us poor. Money from candidates won't make you rich. Do not be desperate. Focus on issues, not money. Often money used in campaigns is dirty money. Do you know its source? Corruption, mafia, drug trafficking, human trafficking, theft from national budget, self-seeking foreigners, selfish businessmen, selfish money lenders. COVID-19 lockdown has left us poor. Money from candidates won't make you rich. Do not be desperate. Focus on issues, not money. Often money used in campaigns is dirty money. Do you know its source? Corruption, mafia, drug trafficking, human trafficking, theft from national budget, self-seeking foreigners, selfish businessmen, selfish money lenders don't abandon your duty elect quality leadership not big spenders Welcome back from that break. Uh, we, are, we are still having uh, technical issues with our guests, but we are going to continue as we await to see whether she can still be able to connect with us. So as we are, as we are uh, initially discussing before we went for a break, uh, one of the points our guests before she broke off because of technical challenges uh, was that the problem Uganda is now facing is, is the problem of money. Too much money is being invested in politics. That's why politics has become a do or die affair. And we have progressively seen things transpiring and citizens are even starting to lose interest in participating in election. We do know that uh, the just concluded 2021 election had over 18 million Ugandans registered to vote. But uh, we do know that 7.7 uh, .7 million Ugandans who are, who, are registered, who, are registered, who are part of the 18 million that are registered did not participate in electing the leaders of their choices. They just stayed home. So the big question is now, why are Ugandans trying uh, to do away or not participate in electing the leaders of their choice? It, this still brings you back to the point we were trying to hint on earlier on that leaders nowadays tend more to focus on things that do not impact on the lives of the citizens in most of the constituencies in Uganda. So citizens are losing interest in participating in processes they believe that does not have an impact in their life. So it's high time we in Africa and also in Uganda try to clean the manner in which our elections are held, we need to make sure we put laws in place that guide how elections are managed and all electoral actors have to abide by those laws. Whoever goes against those laws must be handled and punished and taken to the courts of law because we know things Concern. Okay, our guest is back. I'm so sorry, Abel. You know these things of technology, but yes, I'm back yes, and yes. using my phone. <laughs> yeah, you know issues of technology. <laughs> technology. Technology is always a, a challenge in our countries like Uganda, which has poor connections and bad things. 
So uh, as we are still discussing, you were you were telling me elections is more of a do or die because of the money that's involved that exchanges hands between How? electorates and the politicians during campaigns. So I want to know from you. Oh no. Okay. As we are working out issues of yes, charity welcome. Uh, as you were earlier discussing, yeah. you, you 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 said uh, elections in Uganda is now a do or die affair because of the money involved during campaigns and also yeah, after campaigns. Yeah, yeah. I also want to understand. Yes. I want we, I want us I want you to tell us we have seen beyond just being a do or die and issues of money being transparent. We have seen the kind of campaign messaging that is nowadays being put across to the electorates and also among us these very candidates, they are not fronting their ideas. It's more all about attacking each other, confrontational campaigns. So I don't understand why is it that we are taking this trend of having messages of attacking hate speech instead of fronting politics of ideas and ideology. Now, uh, the failure to front politics of ideas and ideology is again hinged on the question of where do you belong, where... where can you can't access the national case. It becomes a problem for you. People are not being driven by idea. People are not being driven by service delivery. People are being driven by financial demands. Now, there is a difference between the two because ideology, idea is the way to go. The, uh, ideas is the belief system. What is it that you're going to serve the people? If you look at the parliament of uh, the earlier years of, let's say, 1996, 2001, 2006, those were parliaments where people who came on board were people who wanted to serve Ugandans. What are the needs of Ugandans? How can we improve our society? What are the laws we want to pass? They look at the budgets and are portioning those budgets credibly. Right now, every day a supplementary budget comes of 500 million, 300 million, 132 trillion, and it is simply passed because somebody feels if I don't pass this supplementary budget, I will not have some little money that is coming into my pocket. If I pass this supplementary budget, somebody will look at me with a sympathetic eye. I will become a minister. My, I will be able to connect other people to other jobs. You know, so every time somebody is looking in what is in there for me, and I think that has affected our whole political spectrum. That's why there is also a lot of intolerance. The intolerance is coming from, from, from the very fact that everybody is competing for what to eat. If you look at our political parties, they have also been compromised. Look at the speakership race, which we just had recently. That speakership race had money changing hands. We were told Anita Among, the deputy speaker, was in constant conversation with the opposition and she was giving out money to them. So they were changing their mindset towards her based on money, not based on idea, not based on ideology, not based on the work that a speaker is meant to do because a speaker is meant to ensure that they shepherd the house very well they guide the house they they also uh manage the processes around parliament safely but we didn't see the conversation being about the role of a speaker and who was capable therefore to play that role rather what we saw was exchange of money for me i'm a historical for me i'm more important for me i have more people who are supporting me we didn't see the real issues coming out and that is how our politics is you know that uh, american scholar called roosevelt he once mm. told us that uh that the people the, the people we elect A, a reflect have stooped so low. Tell him, my God, uh, something happening to the network. Ebo, do you hear me? I hear you. I hear you. I so uh, as you as you are taking us through, through that route, you 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 come, yes. come out with some. Yes, are you hearing me, Charity? Hello. Hello, Charity. Do you hear me? So. 
she was still giving us her insights on how uh, Uganda's politics has, 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 has de 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 deteriorated from the politics of ideology as now is about politics of confrontation and politics of hate speech and more of money. So as, as uh, one, Ch Ch are, you on? are you hearing me now? I am hearing you now, but somewhere okay. in between I lost you. <laughs> okay, fine. Now, we, 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 in your report or oh, that said launched of recent, uh, we, we saw a lot of people, voters, especially about 17.7 .7 million voters did not show up to vote on election day. So the biggest question now is, why is it that most of the Ugandans, as you have already given us some of the background, most Ugandans are finding it that participating in election is more of a waste of time. Yet we need to have more Ugandans believe and trust the process so that they can be able to elect the leaders of their choices. But now we find that we are in a situation where Ugandans are finding it very difficult to participate in a process they don't believe in. in. What are some of the things that are making Ugandans not trust the electoral process? And what do you think civil society organizations and other stakeholders should do in order to bring back that trust? Aha, uh -huh. very good question, Ebo. Now, what has waned the trust in the process? What has waned the trust in the process are issues of the political environment. It is repressive and coercive. That when people go to engage in processes, is what you talked about. We are fighting each other. Is it about war? It is supposed to be an election. So when somebody sees it's about repression, they just tell themselves, you know what? It's not worth my life. Let me get out of it. That is one. So civil society organizations must deal with the question of a coercive and repressive environment in which our elections are usually contextualized. So conversations must start now on how to deal with repression and coercion. The other thing is the legal framework. If you look at 2021 elections, the legal framework was in contradiction with itself. We had the Public Health Act, and the Public Health Act was saying, you cannot attend rallies because of COVID-19. But we had the supreme law of the land, which was the constitution, which had uh, sections in um, Article 29, and the Bill of Rights, Chapter 4, which were providing for the right to associate and the right to assembly. Now, once you allow me to assemble and you're the supreme law of the land, every other law is subject to the supreme law of the land. So what we saw happening in 2021 was the contradiction in the law. Okay, the contradiction in the law that other people were following the constitution, while others, the police and the army and the electoral commission, were following the health act. So whenever we have a pandemic or when we have a challenging situation like the one we had for 2021, we need to have our laws be merged to have convergences. So civil society now needs to have conversations of where we come up with laws that can govern elections during. Abel, have I lost you? No, no. Ab no, I'm there. I'm, okay. I'm there. When mm. Oh, okay. So the, the, the thing that you need to know is that we need to have a convergence of these laws and make sense of them. So we need to do an electoral reform advocacy for times of times of, of, of pandemics such as the one that we had for 2021. The other thing that we need to do is to look at the campaign process. Amuri Atoboy told us that the days for campaign were 60 days. But of those 60 days, he only campaigned for five days. 55 days, he was interrupted by the police. They were tear gassing him. They were beating him. They were chasing him. They were arresting him. He was before police. Were... Now, if you were a candidate and you cannot engage in the campaign process, then is that an election? You see? So we oh. need to deal with the question of what does campaign mean? Why is the campaign important to an electoral process? And that didn't only happen to... Amuriat, but Amuriat unfortunately was the highest candidate with the number of interruptions, according to the key informant interviews that we had with these candidates. Now, Honorable Chagulani Sentamu went around campaigning in a helmet, a bulletproof helmet. Seriously, an election where a candidate is wearing a bulletproof helmet? Is that now an election or is it a no. war? Because we know people wear bulletproofs when they are going to war. Abel, are you hearing me? Yes, yes. 
Abel? Uh, I'm hearing yeah. you very so well. So the other mm -hmm. issue... That Okay. The other issue that we need to deal with urgently is the, the, the role of security and police and army in elections. Now, what the constitution provides for is the police, because the police is supposed to deal with civilians like you and me. But in every time we have an election, we see the army taking an upper hand. Now, the conversation civil society needs to have is conversation with the army and police and insist that, hey, people, the people who are supposed to manage electoral processes are the police. And the reasons are stipulated very well in the Police Act. They're also stipulated in the Constitution. So we need to push for more of ensuring UPDF is kept out of electoral processes as civil society. Conservatively, we also need the question of voter and civic education. You've talked of the 7.7 .7 million. One of the factors that affected them was some of them thought, if I don't have a voter location slip, I will not be allowed to vote. Those stayed away. There are some who said, ah, the place, the, the, the election has been too violent. Those stayed away. There are those who said, ah, none of these candidates appeals to me. They also stayed away. They don't know that even if none of them appeal to you, you at least need to demonstrate who comes closest to your appeal. So. I think we also need to look at the quality of the candidates that stand for these elective offices. The other thing that I think is critical for civil society organizations to look into is the question of the special interest group elections. Mm. These the special interest group elections, whose interests do they serve? they serve? You look at the UPDF, the 10 of them in parliament, who are they serving? When you look at the youth election, who... Who, who knew the election was going to happen, where it was going to happen from, and at what point did they get the information? When you look at the, 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 the deaf and the blind, the ones that we call PWDs, PWDs, it is mainly the people with physical disability that get elected. What? Yes. What happens to the ones who are blind and the ones who have hearing impairment? Who does the interpretation for them at polling stations? Have we ever seen this happening? No, we haven't seen it happening. Then came the elders. Ebo, are you with me? Yes, I'm listening to you. Ebo? Yes, 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 Charity, I... you're on. So, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you, okay, you, okay. Then... you can continue. Okay, so I was talking about the elders now. That when you look at the elders' facet, they came as a new special group, in, uh, special interest group. Whose interests were they going to serve? Their own interests in parliament. Remember when I told you that we have a skew in the way we are looking at our politics. Everybody mm. is looking at my interest, my group, my, is it about my or is it about the nation? This is the conversation that civil society needs to push forward. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, 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 you talked of civil society working closely and, and making sure they work with citizens. But we have seen in the, in the recently just concluded election, uh, most of the civil society organizations that were wanted to work and observe elections, first of all, even didn't get accreditations. Most of them were denied accreditations. So we wonder, operating in a country whereby you, as, civil, as a civil society, want to participate in the process of, of observing our own election, but you cannot be accredited to, observe that election <laughs> so do we really think that even if you go and engage other institutions like police electoral commission they will give us and hear whatever we are trying to tell them and put that put that into practice or they will just listen to us because most often times they have labor supposed as people who are working for outsiders not ugandans so we are we are, we are now in that point they are, they are labeling us as ah, those people are not working for ugandans so now we ask ourselves, if we want to observe an election and we come up with findings that can help Uganda move forward, why is it that they deny people accreditations to go forward and observe the elections? And, and, and for me, that is unfortunate. We underscored it in the report and we underscored the fact that uh, executive directors of several organizations were arrested. Those who were arrested on election day, I was arrested on the day after elections. 
uh, Nicolas Opio was uh, arrested on money laundering uh, charges uh, before elections. So we've seen those things being used by state institutions. I think what is important is for us as civil society to continue reminding the state institutions that they are actually established to defend the citizens of Uganda. Because when they are swearing, they swear saying, I will defend this constitution and I will defend the citizens of Uganda. And then when they sit in those chairs, they step on the citizens of Uganda and they want to make the citizens look evil when the citizens are demanding for their rights. I think if we look at developed economies, one of the things that have helped the citizens is that they have become aware and aware of their rights. So what we're going to do as civil society is to buy in more and more Ugandans to understand why it is important for us to observe these elections. As they sit right now, they don't understand why we make noise when we can't observe elections. They don't understand. But when we come out and we state why it is important for us to, to observe these elections, they begin to understand that, oh, actually, when these people go there, then we can have proper analysis, then we have conversation on the democracy, then we have conversation on how to improve elections. And by the way, we need to have this conversation on both sides of the divide. We need to talk to the citizens, but we also need to talk to government officials. We need to talk to the NRM. We need to talk to the army. We need to talk to the people in the places of power to show them that, look, you cannot continue saying you're going to promote democracy in the NRA manifesto, and yet you don't want to have conversations on democracy. Then it is paperwork. You're just telling people, Nampewo, wind. You're not giving them the actual truth. So we need to remind them of what they have in their documents. Their documents say they are here to promote democracy. Their documents say they are here to promote transparency in electoral processes and improve them. So can we see efforts being done to allow a conversation to a healthy election, a conversation to understanding why observers are important. So we drum it to parliament, we drum it to police, we drum it to the army, and then we go and confront the electoral commission when all these other institutions also know where we are coming from. So these other people will be saying, yeah, but you are the electoral commission. You don't even know that citizens have to involve themselves in the processes when you're saying, that the elections are for the citizens of Uganda in Article 59, then why are you a Supreme Court judge? You know, we need to have this conversation and urgently. Yeah, that's, that's very true. We need to really have those conversations and engage most of the state institutions so that we can be able to improve on our democracy and also our elections. So we have run out of time, but uh, in a few, two minutes, you can give us some of the key things which you think government and Uganda should take away as recommendations from some of your from the report you just launched of recent yes i want to give the recommendations and i'll summarize them i'm so sorry abel we actually missed a great opportunity i hope mm. another day i can be back yeah. and we talk more on these things i do apologize but i've learned Streamyard today i tried it some mm. time why not <laughs> Now, the recommendations were as follows. To the Electoral Commission, we asked them, BBVK has been failing since 2016. In 2021, it wasn't the only time when it malfunctioned, okay? So we told them to do an audit on the malfunction of the BBVK kits mm -hmm. and come up with a comprehensive report on what causes the malfunction. So the next time they are buying these kits, they know where to buy them from, and they should inform Ugandans because this election was for Ugandans. Then we also told them to learn to tell Ugandans how they are transmitting results. Because every time we come into an election and leave an election, people are unhappy about mainly the question of transmission of results and yes. how results are announced. And that is how we analyze the results they put on the website. And we said from the results they put on the website, President Museveni won at 123 polling stations, 100%. Nobody missed to get elected in those particular polling stations. They're in the report. You can always refer to the report. Now, we challenge the Electoral Commission that to bolster confidence in the way they transmit results and in the way they announce results, they should be able to tell Ugandans this is the equipment we have procured 
and this is how it is going to transmit results so that Ugandans believe in the process. Then we also told the Electoral Commission to do training for its officials early enough. Part of the malfunctioning of BBVK was because electoral officials did not know how to use that BBVK. Now, the other recommendations, of course, some went to the citizens of Uganda. We told the citizens to stop begging for money, that whenever a person comes to ask for, 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 for votes, they are saying, first, give me some money. No, it's our duty now to tell them, you people, we stop begging for money. We ask these people for what is this they are going to represent us for. The other recommendation we gave Parliament where uh, reforms should come on time. We also told them that uh, in 2021, they passed new constituencies, new municipalities, new places on July 30th, 2020, which was too late into the electoral process, which made um, new polling stations, new places to be elected. And the processes for electing these places and demarcation all happened even when party primaries were happening. So what a disorganized election we had. So eventually that comes from the decision by parliament. And then we also told them that uh, the 1 million, 1.2 million young people who failed to get registered to participate in the 2021 elections were a result of an act of parliament. Can we get that revised such that more and more you can close it at political parties? We told the political parties to do two things. They strengthened their infrastructure right from grassroots, but we also told them to avoid hate speech. We saw a lot of burning of posters across the board. Mm. They banned the ones of President Museveni, but they also banned the ones of Chagulani. They banned the ones of Amuria. So we saw across the divide different people banning these posters. I want to thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm thank you. sorry I was late. Thank you, Charity, for those uh, recommendations. But people are here, the viewers are asking, where can they be able to access the SEDU report? The report is online, but uh, I can send it to you, Akfim. I had sent it to Henry, and then you share it with the rest of the people. OK, OK. Thank you so much, Charity, for your time. We hope to host you next time so that we can be able to discuss more into the findings of the report. I uh, want to thank our viewers who have been following us. We know we today we, we were not able to give you the entire time, but we are so sorry for all those technical issues and other things that happened. But we do promise that next time we shall be able to bring you everything, all the findings from the said report, so that we can be able to make people understand and where Uganda's democracy is heading to and what kind of democracy we should be able to look out for so that we can be able to be a more advanced country democratically, not a country that is in democratic reversals each and every after elections have been held. Thank you so much. My name is Abel Esero. I thank you, Charity, for taking time and being able to show up, even if there was a few hours, I mean a few minutes, but it's okay. It's a pleasure we have shared with us some of the findings, which we shall keep on sharing with other people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abel Esero, and thank you for